Yeah, well, really excited. We're we're sitting down with Robbie Dawkins. Robbie, really good to have you. How are you? Great to be here. Uh, doing pretty good. Things right on, are man. are really good uh, in many ways, and a lot of things really challenging. But that's part of life. Come on. So, yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for being willing to jump in with us. We're we're kind of bouncing around this really big subject. We're calling it world conflict, and. Uh, you know, what we do, we try to unpack big subjects, but but talk at a ground level with people yep. that may be active in certain spaces of those big subjects. Um, it looks to me like you do a lot in conflict spaces. Uh, why don't you just quickly talk about some of the stuff that you're doing in spaces of conflict? Yeah, um, it's <laughs> that's it seems like my whole life is involved in spaces with conflict okay um so i mean that's that's at least how it feels lace but uh it, it's 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 um yeah it, it's it's you know with at an early age i mean kind of conflict issues started mm -hmm. um uh, before I was even born, you know, my Satan appeared to my mom and told her that if she allowed me to be born, he'd kill both of us at my birth and appeared <laughs> and appeared in like a human form, you know, in yeah. front of her and, and told her this. And um, I think, uh, you know, uh, my mom was such a godly person. She was like, well, I'll, you know, clearly God's got a plan for his life and that threatens you and I'll never put my hand against anything God's doing. And okay. so, um, you know, um, even if it meant her own life, uh, and, you know, thank God, you know, nothing was happened to her, uh, or me because the devil's a liar and, um, he's always trying to intimidate us and lie to us and deceive us. And so, um, you know, it, it's true. I think that has a lot to do with just sort of what obviously have been my life mission and, and equipping people to live out the book of acts like uh in the bible and and to uh walk that out and uh, of course uh doing that you know has i've gotten very involved in um working with the underground church uh throughout the world primarily in muslim nations all right uh, such as afghanistan iran pakistan um throughout the middle east um and just training and equipping them you know uh to do the things jesus did and to step wow. out and to see the power of god show up and bring people to him and so obviously um as with the apostles and even jesus himself that invites a lot of conflict okay. and uh and so i finally kind of uh decades ago made the decision that rather than avoiding conflict if if it's going to be there, then I might even be willing to start a little bit of it uh, right. because I, why wait, why wait for the enemy to pick a fight, you know? Um, and um, so oh, that's man. what, you know, what, what we've kind of uh, started looking at things. And, you know, I, as I always tell people, man, if the devil's not messing with you, he, you're probably not a threat uh, wow. because he only seems to go after the people that are a threat to him. And so just making that a part of, um, you know, a part of our vision and mission in our ministry, you know, has been to uh, make as many people a threat as possible. Okay. And, um, and the, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, just advancing God's kingdom and doing God's work in it. And so, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, in, in throughout the world, I mean, that's, that's going to invite you know, uh, that kind of response. I mean, because the devil himself is trying to kill all of us and get us fighting one another and, and, uh, resisting each other. And, and so, uh, it's, it's going to invite <laughs> that type of conflict. And, you know, for me back in uh, August, you know, things, uh, we had a lot planned and I was actually supposed to be going on a sabbatical at that time okay. when everything happened in Afghanistan. And of course my whole plan on a break got upended um and um uh, threw us into a whirlwind of uh trying to rescue and um you know provide for afghan brothers and sisters who were being displaced you know um that these are many people uh, we we were help able to help rescue about over, just over 500 um afghans uh and you know a lot of them underground church leaders and uh, be able to help them uh, get out and uh, get to safety. Uh, mm -hmm. There's many that are still there, some by their own choice, uh, because they 
they're determined to see the Taliban converted and following Christ themselves and wow. um, and in that way get revenge for the enemy stealing their nation. So wow. anyway, it's uh, yeah. Why again? Why wait for the devil to pick a fight? Go well, after him. <laughs> so, so much I want to talk with you about. I think like a couple layers. One, this big macro level of conflict, like political dynamics. Two, the micro, like on the ground, working with people that are actually affected by war. Um, let's just like hang out on the Afghanistan front for a bit. Sure. So, so Afghanistan, August. You guys have like engaging in this pretty active rescue operation like i think in the west you know we we see things on newsreels and we're like yeah war isn't good but we don't have the kind of stories you have like you're on the ground working with individuals maybe just give a glimpse to the to the wider body of christ like hey here's what people are actually affected like here's what people who are affected by war look like yeah I mean, I, I've I've had the privilege, you know, for the sake of the gospel, to be arrested and incarcerated four different times. Uh, three wow. of those were in Afghanistan. Wow. Uh, one of them was in Russia, um, and um, and so you know, dealing with that level, you know, th that gives you an immense equity with the people on the ground. You know, mm -hmm. when that happens, I mean, when it's happening, you're going, oh, this really stinks, you know, <laughs> uh, sure, sure doesn't feel good, you know, especially when they're telling you they're going to kill you the entire time. But, um, you know, uh, just that kind of uh, interacting, you know, with them and, and, and seeing it, you know, it, for, for and for many of them, many of them, of course, have been a, in, arrested and incarcerated, but, you know, the majority hadn't. And so um, that immediately, you know, kind of gains you um, credibility as somebody that they'll go, hey, we'll follow you, you know, because you've you've actually um, I, while I was there on my second trip, uh, third, second or third trip, um, while we were out on the streets uh, sharing the gospel and praying for the sick and seeing people get healed and stuff. One of the guy, one guy shouted kofair, which in Farsi means infidel and Dari which is what the Afghan speaks. And, and he punched me right in the nose. I mean, I, I could feel it break when he did it. Um, and blood just started coming out of my nose. And it was a short little Afghan dude. I was, it totally caught me off guard. And he just like, Pow! <laughs> just really smell it, man. Passionate, huh? Yeah, it truly, truly was. And, and, um, and, you know, it was really amazing because I was, you know, it, it, it didn't hurt too terribly bad, but, you know, I mean, my eyes started getting black and stuff like that. Uh, it's cool because the guys prayed for me there and it was totally healed, uh, wow. stopped bleeding immediately and, and no, it turned out there was no break in it, um, you know, at, at the end. I, I could feel it break. So, I mean, I knew it had, yeah. but it was totally healed and restored, but uh, that gives you immense equity. So leading them and, and giving you know them uh you know having that sort of um demonstrating that sort of courage to follow if you will yeah. um you know help them to be able to say hey we'll trust you you know and one, one you know i remember two of them said you know we know now we can trust you because you've lost blood with us and that's sort of a you know a Pashtun phrase that they have there of when you lose blood with somebody it means that you're that you're kind of almost like blood brothers in some way especially over uh -huh. a cause and so um you know for them that that gained a uh, quick equity which helped in being able to help rescue them later because then they're like okay we'll trust you and and you know for them i mean it was just it was horrible uh because you know um the mm -hmm all of a sudden, you know, things were going really well in Afghanistan. I mean, there was, there was always trouble. There were explosions and, sure. you know, continued killings. I mean, it's the most dangerous country in the world. So, I mean, that's just the way it is. But, um, you know, I, I had been there, not this past January, but the January before in 2021, um, and was uh, arrested then and, and held for a few days. Um, but, uh, for, again, for them, you know, for the, then in August, just, you know, eight months later, uh, to see what happened. And 
even even in that arrest and as bad as that was and some of the things that happened, I mean, they were trying to torture me with uh, not leaving marks, but putting me in these uh, in a freezing container, you wow. know, for for several hours. And then, you know, where it was like 10 degrees and then pulling me out and putting me in this hot box. And then they start questioning you when you're in the heat, when all, you know, pins and needles are all over your body because you're thawing and your, you know, hypothermia was starting to set in. And then they would, they would move you back and forth, back and forth. And it just, you know, that kind of experience just drains you. Um, And uh, again, um, you know, coming away from that and, and being able to relate to them for many of them who had been arrested and have been through that and other forms of torture, mm. um, you know, was, was really giving a, a real, um, cre- again, a credibility for them to sort of follow. And so when all this happened, you know, um, nobody imagined that, you know, Kabul would fall to the Taliban within a day, but uh, January 20th of uh, last year, as soon as the, or 21st, as soon as the Biden administration took over, um, Donald Trump treated uh, Afghanistan like a business acquisition. So he put all of the, all of the uh, military police, uh, uh, every, everybody in a civic role, in a, any sort of paid position in government of any kind, they got their paycheck from the United States. And he was always like, listen, um, you know, you vote whoever you want. We're not going to interfere with democracy, but whoever you put in, they're going to have to remember where they get their check from. And it comes from the United States. And so he wasn't, he wasn't ever trying to influence who they chose. But once they were chosen, they kind of had this bigger brother of the U.S. government sort of with their hand on their shoulder. And that was actually a brilliant strategy. He was also trying a lot of people, a lot of critics were talking to, you know, why was he talking to the Taliban, all this? He was offering the Taliban a seat at the table. But again, they would be paid for the by the U.S. government and they would be one an additional party in the mm-hmm. Afghan government. And but nobody in Afghanistan was going to vote in any of the members of the Taliban other than the Taliban themselves. Mm-hmm. And so it was actually a brilliant strategy and it was working. Things were working. Things were changing. But as soon as the Biden administration took over, all that shut down and everybody stopped getting paid. And mm-hmm. so these guys had been without paychecks for you know seven months and were unable to feed their families. Mm-hmm. Well, then when the tell, because as soon as they took over, they stopped the payments. And so what ended up happening was uh, the Taliban rolls into town with truckloads of U.S. currency and uh, saying to these uh, Afghan military and police, if you lay down your arms, uh, we'll give you money to feed your family. And so they did, you know, and so that because they were starving. And so um, and and the only reason why that Trump was saying he would withdraw the troops uh, was if they stayed on the payroll, which would keep sort of, again, a hand on their shoulder to keep them in check. And so his strategy of withdrawal was actually a perfect strategy um, Mm -hmm. and would have worked. I mean, this is you have to realize this part of the world is full of corruption. I mean, our government's full of corruption, too. But but this but this particular part of the world, everything is corrupt. And so uh, taking that that um, stance in that position would have. would have worked really well and, okay. and, and would have been a good one. But of course that ended up throwing all of us who had been working there, which there, you know, obviously, I mean, honestly, I, and only one other, one or two or three other Americans are, am I aware of that, that in church ministry, were working there, okay. um, you know, it's very, very few because of the danger level. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, anyway, it just, it just threw everything into a, a tizzy. And I mean, we had guys who were digging holes under their houses, uh, Christian leaders who were living underground, eating roots uh, Mm -hmm. that they were finding in the ground, 
you know, tapping into PVC water pipes to drink water um, and their ha family having to, you know, live under there for as long as a month just to survive, just to, to, wow. to stay clear of the Taliban. So, I mean, it was it was horrible. And, you know, one of those two who did that was also a friend of mine that was a government official in the Afghan government okay. who, in order to spare his life, uh, because he was a known Christian as a government worker, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize in Afghanistan, it's against the law to be a Christian. And so, oh. you know, it's penalty of death. And, and, um, you know, like, uh, there's only two nations, three nations that I know of in the world where it's penalty of death for bringing Bibles into them. One is Saudi Arabia, one is Afghanistan, the other is North Korea. Okay. And so, um, you know, it's, um, very severe punishment for being a Christian and also for ever trying to proselytize. And so the work we were doing, you know, going in and doing training, uh, you know, uh, all the time was, um, was very, very risky. Yeah. Um, and so the secret police, when I was arrested last January, the secret yeah. police had brought me in and they'll torture you. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll kill, you know, they'll kill you. Typically you don't never heard from again uh, when that happens. Um, but by the grace of God, you know, and they, they, they would have had God not intervened. I mean, it was a real miracle how, how the intervention happened and that wasn't through any government or anything like that. But what ended up taking place, uh, you know, after that was we were concerned that all of a sudden, you know, that the government, the Afghan government was already telling me, we'll never give you another visa again. You'll never enter the country again because of what the secret police had. But by the grace of God, what ended up happening was that they ended up uh, as soon as the Taliban took over, the secret police destroyed all their computers, burned all their files and all that. So all the video and pictures they had of me training Afghan leaders out on the streets were destroyed. So there's no... Wow evidence there and that was just a miracle so i mean as bad as it was that the taliban took over it also you know for for me on a personal level and ministry level it was uh it was a blessing because um otherwise i would have never been able to enter the country again tell people about the taliban a little bit like those that don't know how they operate and the kind of people we're talking about yeah, the Taliban, you know, the majority of the Taliban are from the Pashtun people. Uh, and a lot of a lot of a lot of people in the United States only really know about the Pashtuns uh, in Afghanistan. But you have the Pashtuns, you have the Hazaras. That's another people group, a large people group. And that the Hazaras are where the majority of the Christians come from. But almost all of the Taliban members are Pashtun. Um, you also have the Tajiks and a couple of other minor, uh, more minority people, uh, tribal groups. Um, but uh, the the Pashtun are, are kind of, <laughs> they're, the, they're the scrappers and the fighters. Um, mm -hmm. They're kind of the, uh, you know, if, if anybody has any redneck family members, they're kind of, I've got a lot of redneck family members, so I can speak from experience. Um, they're, they're kind of the, yeah, they're kind of the fighters, the scrappers. They're, you know, during Ramadan, they get more angry uh, because of, you know, they, they can't eat or drink during the daytime and it's really hot of course and so it's really miserable um but they they kind of are are that type of people uh group and so there's a lot of um that infiltrates into the a lot of their ideology and a lot of their their uh, you know uh, how they function. Um, and so they're, they're an interesting group. Um, but the, the truth is the Taliban only had 75,000 members, um, in the entire country of Afghanistan, whereas the, just the police and military Afghan police and mili military alone were over 350,000 or excuse me, 325,000. Oh. So they were, they were grossly outnumbered, but mm -hmm. again, the only reason why they were able to take over is somehow they were being funded. And again, they, they came in with U.S. dollars. Uh, uh, Nobody supposedly knows where that came from, but, uh, the, but they had tons of cash, which they didn't have before when Trump was dealing with them and negotiating with them because they were trying to get money. Um, wow. And so um, they had actually stopped killing a lot of the people that they had taken uh, that they had kidnapped. So like they, if they kidnapped a Westerner, they, uh, before they would kill them immediately, they stopped doing that and started holding them for ransom because they were, they
they were very short on cash. Okay. And so it was shocking to see them come into town into Kabul in August with all this money. And yeah. everybody was kind of like, where did that come from? Um, you know, and so nobody really knows, you know, but um, it's uh, very suspicious. So the Taliban, they're, they're not reasonable thinking people. They're very, um, you know, they're very strict in their uh, religious practice. Uh, mm-hmm. They're very harsh. Um, yet they'll, you know, they'll come in and rape women um, even though, of course, that's a violation of the Quran, but but they see it justified based on the fact that uh, they, that they they the people the women that they will rape they will claim are infidels, okay. and so that they're kofar, and so if they're kofar, they have a right to do that uh, mm-hmm. as long as they're not supposedly be, being pleasured by it, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But of course, there's a lot of conflict in that, and sure. you know. A lot of their a lot of their inspiration in doing all these acts of violence is, you know, that they'll get, you know, X amount of additional virgins in, in paradise, uh, you know, um, if they if they do these acts of violence. And so it's a it's a very, you know, the Quran itself is a very confusing book because it's mm-hmm. it's it's not, you know, like the, the Bible is kind of strategically outlined it as best as they could in chronological order uh with the um with the sarats in the quran it's from the you know from the greatest to the smallest and smallest to the greatest based on if you're reading it the arabic side or the english side and so it's there's no real chronological order and you'll see it's a very confusing book and so uh mm-hmm. you know at one point it's you know uh sort of like you know the people of the book are good meaning us as Christians uh, are they they refer to Muhammad would call them the people of the book okay. um, but then it, you know he turn around and say to kill the infidel and clearly spells out Christians are infidels okay. you know will gain you things in paradise and so it, it's a it's it's very conflicting uh, okay. and so because of that you know you have a lot of room for conflict and confusion yeah. um, you know within that that particular people group any experience you've had with uh, conversion, you know, somebody that was maybe oh, yeah. devout, zealot, like just a zealot as a Muslim, maybe even Taliban members, and then getting into their stories and seeing their depravity, need for God and wanting God and changing. Any, any stories there? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I've led a Taliban member to Christ, uh, yeah. you know, now former Taliban, not current Taliban, yeah. uh, but, you know, was a Taliban leader uh, and came into our meeting. And I mean, this guy normally, you know, would have killed us. Uh, wow. But, you know, he he got really hit by the Holy Spirit. We were doing a ministry time, which means we're praying for people to encounter the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And he got really touched and fell to the ground. Um it, that they documented that and uh you, we didn't say who it was because we were trying to protect his identity uh but um to where he fell to the ground you know being just overcome by the power of the holy spirit wow. um you know people don't realize these healing prophetic deliverance ministry of god's manifest presence these are really weapons of war um you know when jesus said i came to destroy the works of the devil i mean that's how he did it you know, it was by healing the sick, by casting out demons, by multiplication of food. This is how, how Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, um, when, but, but one of the times that, that was really impactful on the last trip I was there, again, last January, was, uh, and this is how I ended up getting out of the, um, of, of jail and out of, uh, uh, away from the secret police was, a, a guy came out, I, we were praying for, I was some of the young guys that was training out on the streets in the marketplace. Um, this kid with a broken leg got healed and he just broken it like three or four days before. And wow. his leg was instantly healed and he was able to even run around on it. And, you know, he, before he was on these makeshift crutches, but then he was like literally running around on it, totally healed. And, um, you know, ended up giving his life to Christ. Well, this guy came out of a shop and they said, the guys that were with me, they said, that guy persecutes Christians. We better get out of here. 
And I turned around and I looked and I said, what guy? And they said, that guy right there. And the guy that was there, he had a club in his hand, but he was just standing there watching. He was, his jaw was kind of dropped and he was watching. And I said, well, he doesn't seem to be doing anything. Let's keep going. And they were like, eh, you know, let's get out of here. He's beaten us up before, you know, we'd, we'd prefer to get going. I'm like, okay. So we went and we got in the car, but he stood there watching for a long time. Well, when I was in jail, um, at the secret police, they, they came when they sat me down to interview me. And this guy's got these pictures of all these torture victims, you know, behind his head, you know, um, you know, they're, they're trying to get in my head, you know, (laughs) by doing that. And, um, and he started, um, you know, he started, he said, before I get into the questioning you, I got a quick question for you. And I said, what's that? And he goes, uh, did you pray for a kid in the marketplace whose leg was healed? And I was like, well, obviously, you know, I did because you wouldn't be asking me the question if you didn't know that. And I said, why, why do you ask? And he said, well, he goes, was there a shop owner that came out that was holding a club that uh, was coming towards you? And, but he stopped and was watching. And I said, well, yeah. And I said, why? And he said, well, he's here. And immediately I was like, oh, no. I was like, they got an eyewitness. This is bad. You know, he's going to, he's willing to take the stand against me, which, I mean, there's no court there. You know, they're just, they just take you out bed back and put you, put a bullet in your head or chop your head off one or the other. And so I was like, man. And so I, I was like, you, well, yeah, obviously, you know that. And he said, well, he says he's here, but he's not here to testify against you. He's here to take your place. He's willing to exchange himself for you. And I said, why? And he said, because he saw you pray for the boy, which it was actually the guys that I was training who did it, but I wasn't going to, I didn't want to throw them under the bus. So I didn't <laughs> say that, you know, I was like, yeah, I did it, you know? <laughs> and, and I, with all these guys, you know, what I do when I'm in these countries is I'll give each guy that's with me like 20 bucks. And I'll be like, Hey, if we get stopped, you tell them you're a paid translator. And then that way, you know, if we get stopped, you run, you know, leave me behind. That's fine. They're younger. They got better knees anyway. And I'm like, just get out of here. And, you know, I'll, I'll deal with the authorities. And, um, and so, uh, but he said, yeah, he's here. And he keeps saying, you're a good man that he watched what you did and that clearly God is with you. And, and he's here to put exchange himself for you that he'll take your place and serve your sentence. And he said, we even told him that could be in death. And he said, I'm willing to do it because he's a good man. And wow. it turns out he knew the boy. And so when he saw the boy get healed, he knew it was a miracle. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that guy saved my life. And, you know, he was one of the first guys we saved in Afghanistan. We got him out of there quickly and his whole family as quickly as possible and save them in return can you talk about that when you so the saving the rescuing the projects like talks talk details what are you what are you guys doing how's it going down yeah well but you know by the grace of god we got a lot of uh, the majority of our people we've gotten them to safe enough places we've got them registered in other countries many you know many are here in the united states uh registered as you know refugees uh in those countries uh, there's still, you know, several that we're working on, um, uh, or not many that we're working on, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we, so the first thing we were just trying to do is get them to safety. We were just trying to get them out of Afghanistan. Okay. Um, it was difficult because one of, you know, <laughs> the two countries that were most open were Pakistan and Iran, which are two extremely dangerous countries as well, but they're just not as dangerous as Afghanistan. And so um, we were trying to, you know, get them to safety as much as possible and to get them to a, you know, to where that we could, um, you know, just, you know, where they're not getting killed. Uh, and we were able to to get them out. Uh, we were housing them, feeding them, sustaining them, okay. you know, while we were working on a process. Uh, we had some friends that were in, in some of those governments that were trying to help. I'm not going to say which ones, but no. we're trying to help uh, to to, you know, gain some, you know, a place of safety for them. But the problem is, is that. Um, you know, the only way that you can truly have them stay in those countries is if you register them as Christians. Well, the Taliban is still in Pakistan. 
yeah. you know, um, it's they're in the government. And so, uh, you know, you're still at risk. And even when I went over there to see, to check on some of our groups that were crossing, I went while we were having uh, one particular group cross the border yeah. um, at the Chaman border. Uh, you know, it was, it was a very, um, it was very risky because I mean, we had, you know, I was getting death threats while I was there. I mean, people were starting to pick up and realize, and, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, I was, I was staying at a, a particular hotel in, as, in Islamabad as kind of a staging area, but um, they were, you know, they were notifying me, you know, that, you know, this whole hotel had been hit before, you mm-hmm. know, by uh, radicals, you know, and that, you know, basically we'll do it again, you know, type mm-hmm. of thing and stuff. And so I, at one point I ended up telling my team that was there, I said, everybody go back to Lahore, get out of here, leave me here. I'll find my own way back. But it just got to where it was too dangerous for anybody else to be even with me. Wow. Um, and, um, you know, there it's, it's very, very challenging, you know, uh, from a distance, it seems, it seems so cool and it is cool. And, you know, you're, you're about God's business and, and saving yeah. lives and it's amazing, but at the same time, you know, you're, you're, you're putting your own on the line and, 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 you know, um, yeah, it's just, it's, but, but it's, it's what you do, you know, to, uh, to try to help these guys out. And so uh, many of them that were coming in, you know, s- still a lot of them are struggling with PTSDs uh, just mm-hmm. for even the weeks or months that they were hiding from the Taliban. Um, and uh, many of them just miracles, uh, you know, uh, of getting out. And I mean, um you know, I mean, I could tell you so many stories and testimonies, of people there that are, that were boots on the ground of just incredible thing. And one, let me tell you this one, there was one yeah. group about, about 20 of them that were all these young sort of millennial Afghans that I'd been training for, you know, uh, a couple of years now, you know, um, they get to the border and uh, the Pakistan government said, we're shutting the border and sealing the border. So no more Afghans can cross. And, um, the guys uh, said, you know, Ravi taught us about the authority of Christ that's been given to us. They said, we need to use that authority right now. And so they, they, they stepped back about 50 feet and they pointed to the border and said, we command that border to open up by the authority of Christ and to allow us through right now. It's kind of like, you know, Red Sea crossing type thing. Yeah. And then they went right back up to the very officers who told them no and said, you're supposed to let us across this border. And they said, okay. And they let them all across. It was just, it was just a miracle. I mean, story after story lace that are like that of just any, just crazy, you know, a miracle stuff that was just happening of, of God, you know, just getting people uh, through of, of impossible situations. And you got to realize we, we had, uh, teams that we were, I mean, you know, when you're doing this kind of thing, you, you, you have to work with some tools you don't want to work with, you know, so you're having, you know, you have to pay human traffickers to smuggle groups of people out. And I mean, it, wow. it, it's, it's horrible. You don't want to do that. You don't want to work with them. And, you know, uh, but, but it, it, they're the only people that'll do it and the only okay. people that you can work with. And, and so, uh, but with that, you know, we were having to not use some and not use others. And, and, you know, uh, along the way, some of those gave their life to Christ. And so even though they were evil people, you know, a few got to hear the gospel and, and got to accept and receive Christ. And so, you know, um, it's, it's such a hard thing, you know, you're kind of in it going, man, I feel really conflicted about this. I don't feel, you know, but, but, but there, but it's like, okay, do we lose hundreds of people or do we, you know, work with these people that we know are not godly and unrighteous and evil uh but by the grace of god we ended up seeing some of those come into the kingdom you know because of 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 the situation so god's a redemptive god you know i certainly don't certainly don't endorse what they're doing at all but uh well they i mean they end up they end up there for their own reasons and they've got their own backstories and man they're they really do they're making contact with jesus people that's a good thing so it is it is a good thing I love it. Can, can we do maybe the last couple of minutes together? If, if you're up for this, like maybe pulling up and talking at that macro level about conflict, war. I mean, to, for us as Jesus followers, I'm like, the solution is love. And hey, let's just 
erase all the division, but it, it, there are complexities. I mean, there are, it sounds like you have a pretty strong footprint in the Middle East. Anything you would want to just like educate, well, educate the unknowers, like we don't I, know. What is it yeah. like? How, how can this stuff shift? Yeah, first of all, I'm not anti-war at all. Uh, just something to be clear about my stance on that. I mean, you know, uh, God clearly in the Old Testament, you know, tells, you know, Israel to go to war and to fight and sometimes in the, not to completely wipe out entire people groups. Um, and so I'm not anti-war, you know, obviously we want to be a part of a righteous war. We don't want it to be in corruption or, or to fuel evil. Sure. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing right now in the Ukraine, I mean, we've, we've been able to send about uh, right at this moment, I think about a hundred thousand dollars and, uh, relief in medical uh, supplies and and food and and clothing and blankets to uh, to the Ukraine to some of the areas that have been hit the hardest um, and so I mean but our our job as the church I think uh, the Christian believers followers of Christ is to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to you know if we've got two coats to give one of them away um, mm -hmm. so I mean there is that you know, commissioning that Jesus gives us to, uh, to do that. So I think that's part of it. The other part is that if we can influence and stop it and to see, you know, evil undone, you know, um, then that's, you know, a part of that and that we should be a part of that. You know, I'm very supportive of military troops and, you know, people in the military serving our country and other countries for the purpose of freedom, yep. you know, that we have to do those types of things. There's sometimes many of my friends who have been like, man, I'm not sitting by I'm going to go help in the Ukraine. And I, when they mean go help, they mean go help fight and God bless them for it. Yeah. You know, you got a big bully that's there, you know, throwing their weight around, um, you know, and there somebody needs to step up. I mean, that's a righteous, that's a righteous fight. And, yeah. and so, you know, I, I think avoiding any of that or dodging any of that is a mistake, but at the same time, always making sure that there's a righteous motive and a righteous intent yeah. and uh, seeing that, that happen and that take place and not, you know, um, discarding, you know, that or, or just going, well, we're just going to love everybody and everything will work out now, nah, you know, yeah. I mean, Mike, you know, I, you know, maybe some people disagree with this. I don't really care, but you yeah. know, my, me spanking my kids is a lot is an action of love and yeah. it's me telling them, you know, I don't do it because I like it. I hate it. It, it yeah. hurts me you know, and pains me, but yet I, I want to see them follow down a righteous path and a righteous road and to know that there's consequences. Uh, sometimes the only time the brain can associate evil with, you know, uh, something that's wrong is, is for pain to be involved. And, and, you know, so that has to happen, but, um, you know, so there are positive conflicts and there are things that are, uh, that are positive, that, that draw positive outcomes, but avoidance of it and just sort of sticking our head in the sand is certainly not the way to go. Yeah. And if we do that in this nation, we'll lose the entire nation. And we're on the verge of that if we're not careful. Wow. You know, we've got to speak up. We've got to step up. We've got to, we've got to you know, hold up a, you know, uh, a righteous standard. Otherwise, we'll see, we'll lose everything. I love it. Man, so good talking with you. How do how do people connect more with what you guys are doing? Find you, follow you. Well, I'm I'm on uh, social media. Back on Twitter now. Thank you, Mr. Musk. Uh, mm -hmm. My my Twitter account had been totally uh, dis uh, disengaged, but uh, went on right after hearing the news, and it powered right back up. So wow. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how that happened so quick. Uh, but uh, but thank God it did. And uh, so we're on. You know. Uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, just my name, Robbie Dawkins, or, but my website, RobbieDawkins.com, and it's Robbie with a Y, R-O-B-B-Y, D-A-W-K-I-N-S, but uh, we're putting out regular newsletters and different communication, telling people how they can help and be involved in different things uh, regarding these, you know, different areas, and, and right. um, yeah, so look at anything, that. Yeah, anything there you want to highlight, just stuff you're doing that you're wanting to let people know about, like, yeah, we're starting schools throughout the Middle East for training uh, underground church leaders. Uh, we'll be doing one in June and July for, uh, you know, a, a, you know, hopefully about 100 Arab, young Arabic speakers. Wow. Uh, I can't say which country it'll be in. Um, sure. I know where it's at, but I just can't say. Uh, yeah. And we're going to be training them and equipping them. Uh, if people want to help with that, they, I mean, obviously, a lot of these 
you know, young millennial people, they, they don't have any money or any way, but we're going to, you know, house them, feed them, uh, take them out on the streets, show them how to uh, demonstrate the kingdom of God. And so, yeah, any, any way anyone wants to help with that or support with that, we're also going to be doing it in, you know, uh, some other Farsi speaking countries and, um, you know, uh, just trying to equip and train. We've got people from Iraq that are going to be a part of that, from Kuwait, from uh, all over the Middle East that will participate in those, but just training them for several weeks and uh, showing them how to do the stuff Jesus did to see nice. the Middle East change. Come on. That's exciting, man. So thanks again so for spending time with us. Super inspiring, Boy. informative. Um, so yeah, find Robbie Dawkins, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And man, again, much grace way. Peace. Keep up the good work. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure.